Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Dan Zamansky. I'm a senior product manager on our database services team. And I'm excited to be sharing the stage today with Kudeep from Expedia and um, Ian from Mapbox. So here's all we have for you today. We'll start with an overview of what is a NoSQL database, what is the category of NoSQL databases. We'll talk a little bit about the concept of a managed database service, um, what it is, and why we think it's something that's worth considering. We'll then do an overview of the two uh, managed NoSQL services that we offer today at AWS, is DynamoDB and ElastiCache. And then we'll have Kudeep and Ian share their use cases of building really cool applications using these two services. Um, we will, um, we have almost a full hour of content, but we'll stay here at the end. So if you have any questions, please come see us. We'll be happy to talk to you. So with that, let's jump right into it in NoSQL. So NoSQL as a category gained a lot of popularity in the recent years, um, providing a response for some of the limitations of traditional SQL-based databases. And mainly, those limitations are the need for a rigid schema, and a lot of the modern data that you get is unstructured and it gets from different sources. Um, and the other one is the need to have a high performance, high and consistent performance and availability at scale. And uh, these are some limitations of traditional um, SQL databases, and this is what the NoSQL category came to, um, came to address. Now, NoSQL is not one database. It's a whole category of databases. You have uh, the four main types, which are the key value stores, uh, columnar stores, document stores, and graph stores. So here's what's available on AWS. We have two managed services. One is DynamoDB, which is uh, a key value in a document store. And the other one is ElastiCache, which is an in-memory key value store. Um, we'll talk about both of those more in a few minutes. Now, also, AWS is obviously an open platform, so you can install and run any technology that you choose. So you have a list here of just some of the common names you might have heard, um, but you can essentially install anything. Now, when I say we have two managed services, let's talk a little bit more about what that concept means. So when you're building an application and you want your database to run, Besides actually building that database layer and optimizing you know, your queries, optimizing your application, there is a lot of overhead involved in making sure that your database works correctly. So this is a list of tasks that you need to take care of if you are running it on your own um, servers on premise. And you see that you have all the way from you know, hardware-related tasks, binds, stacking servers, cooling, um, electricity, and then it goes up through operating system, software-related, configuring your database. So there's a lot of things that you need to do which are not um, the core of your business, the core of your application. If you move it from on-premise to AWS, to the cloud, and you run it self-managed on EC2, this is where we offload some of those tasks for you. So you no longer need to you know, buy servers. You no longer need to install the operating system. So some of the things we take care for you, but there is still a lot to be done on your end to make sure that your database works correctly. And this is where the value of managed services comes in. If you switch from self-managed to a managed database services, then we offload all of these tasks from you so that you could focus on you know, what matters most is your application. And we really, we deal with a lot of customers kind of going through this both those that are starting to build their application and also more established customers. And they, they always have the same message that, you know, speed in business matters, time to market matters, the time that your developers, you know, spend um, matters. So you want to make sure that all of that is invested in what is differentiating your business, and which is your application. So the purpose of this slide is really a small, this is a small subset out of many thousands and thousands of customers that are using our managed services. And the purpose of the slide is to show that there is really no one kind of type of customer, whether it's you know, large companies or startups or a certain 
verticals or certain use case that can benefit from offloading you know, the management layer to AWS. It's really something that's across the board regardless of you know, what is your business and what is the size of your company. And that's why you see here all the way from you know, um, small successful startups and all the way to big enterprises like Adobe and uh, TV Global and Electronic Arts. So let's talk more about the two services that we offer in a managed fashion. Let's start with DynamoDB. DynamoDB is our managed NoSQL database service uh, developed within Amazon. It is highly scalable, which means that it can scale to any, essentially any size, both in terms of um, the size of your database and in terms of the throughput that you are uh, doing for reads and writes for this database. Um, it provides consistent single-digit millisecond latency at any scale. And uh, this is an important point, so let me spend a few more seconds talking about that. When uh, you start using, and if you start building an application, your database is very small, and you have tens or hundreds of records, it really doesn't matter, almost doesn't matter what technology you use, whether it's a SQL or NoSQL or what NoSQL, all of those will be fast, you know, the performance will be good. Um, where databases are really tested is when you take those you know, tens and hundreds of records to many thousands and millions and billions. And that's where many of um, the NoSQL technologies, many of the other technologies, they start breaking or your performance deteriorates. And that's not something that happens in DynamoDB. So regardless of the size of your database, regardless of um, the load that you have, you'll still have consistently um, low latency, which is both good for your application. It's also a very good thing for testing because when you just build your you know, small application and you see that it works in this small configuration, then you know that you know, regardless of how big your DynamoDB table grows, you will still have the same predictable performance. Another thing to mention here is DynamoDB is highly durable and available. So every time you do a write to DynamoDB, we store it on three different partitions and make sure that your data is safe. So DynamoDB table, let's dive a little bit into how it looks. DynamoDB table consists of items. Um, each item consists of attributes. So attributes are the, building, the basic building blocks of DynamoDB. Now, once you put your data in attributes within your table, this is where you want to query it. The way to query it is the first way we give you to query it is by assigning a hash key. So hash key is a unique key identifier. So think of a list of, um, think of a list of students, for example, in a class, and you have a unique ID for your students. So you can query, you know, give me student with student ID uh, number five or 10, whatever. The second option we have is a combination of a hash key and a range key. So in the first one, if you choose to only use hash key, then your hash key needs to be unique. If you choose to use a combination of hash key and range key, then your hash key no longer needs to be unique, but the combination of hash and range key for every item does need to be unique. And with range key, you can do, um, it's more powerful because you can also do range queries. So for example, if you have, uh, if we're talking about students, so you have your hash key as a identifier of a certain class, and um, let's say you ranked your students you know, based on their grades, and you say, give me the, the first 10 you know, students with the highest grades on this class. So this is, a, this is something you can do when you have um, a hash key and a range key. Um, one, more, one more thing to um, point here. Um, generally, when we kind of talk to customers that start working on, on their application, they're choosing database layer, one mistake we sometimes see them do is they see a certain database of technology and they decide that they're going to adapt you know, their application and their query parents to make sure that this engine or this technology works well. And um, we've, we see that happens and really our recommendation, our advice is to do the opposite, is first think, you know, what is, what is your application? Ask yourself some questions like, what are going to be my query patterns? What are my latency requirements? You now, what are my throughput requirements? Um, what is going to be the size? You know, do I need high availability or not? Uh, once you have all of those figured out, it will be much easier for you to decide 
you know, whether um, what technology is optimal for you. In terms of data types, DynamoDB supports all the um, data types that you would expect from a key value store as well as a document store. And really with all of that you know, management and the ability to scale uh, in essentially indefinitely and provide this high availability, you would expect that there is a lot of kind of configuration and tweaking going into this. And you know, this, is a, this is a cool thing about DynamoDB that the entire DynamoDB is only 13 APIs, as you see here on the left, that control you know, your tables as well as your items, both for reads and for writes. And what you don't see here is any kind of you know, increase, decrease, take um, snapshot, replicate. There is none of this because this is the, essentially the essence of a managed service of us taking care of it for you. We recently launched DynamoDB Streams and we added the four APIs on the right. DynamoDB Streams is a log of changes. So every time you make a write to DynamoDB, it also gets updated in DynamoDB Streams. And then you can send the streams to other services such as Kinesis or Lambda. And there's a lot of cool things you can do with it. We actually have a workshop later today that talks about um, event-driven computing processing with DynamoDB and Lambda. And uh, when we get to the further learning section, I'll talk more about that. So what is the input that we require for you to be able to run DynamoDB for you? Well, the, the only question that kind of we need your input for is um, what is the throughput? Um, how many reads and how many writes are you going to do to that DynamoDB table? I know these two are separate, so it's like two knobs that you can turn up or down in how many reads and how many writes. Once you tell us that, then behind the scenes we will scale the data into enough DynamoDB physical partitions that we can accommodate you know, any size and any throughput. And this is, this is something that is dynamic. So if you have, a, for example, an e-commerce app and you have a, you know, a steady load and now you're preparing for you know, Black Friday shopping, so you can just dial this up, you know, provision more capacity. When you're done, dial it down, and you only pay for the capacity that you have provisioned at the moment. So this is a really cool thing. Think about how much effort would it be to scale some um, database when you do all of that scaling up and scaling down on your own. With that, let's switch to our second service for today, and that's Amazon Elastic Cash. Amazon Elastic Cash is our in-memory service. And uh, when I say that, the first question I often get is, you know, what is, what's cool, what's interesting about putting my data in memory? And really, what's interesting is when you switch from having your data on a disk um, to switching it in memory, you're talking about orders of magnitude of lower latency and uh, faster throughput. So it's, it's really a big, big difference. You can, uh, if you have a disk-based database, you can be talking about single digit to tens of milliseconds in latency. Uh, when you have in memory, like Elastic Cache, calls to Elastic Cache will return in less than one millisecond. So the second question is, why is it important? Well, when we interact with our customers on a daily basis, what we see is a big um, increase in growth in real-time use cases. Now, everybody has, obviously, a mobile device. They're playing uh, mobile games that require real-time performance. Um, ad tech, of course, requires real-time performance. E-commerce, social apps, so there's more and more of that. Um, and this is where you need your database to be highly performant. Another thing is load on your application would uh, many times be spiky and unpredictable. So you will, uh, you know, you have uh, some application and now one of the celebrities tweeted about you and you have 10 or 100 times more people you know, um, checking out your app to, you know, just this evening, you need to make sure that your app is able to handle that. So Amazon Elastic Cache um, is a managed service that manages two open source in-memory key value stores, okay? two open source key value um, in-memory key value stores. So the first word you see here is open source. So the difference, or one of the differences um, between DynamoDB and Elastic Cache is DynamoDB, the technology that was built, developed within Amazon. Um, Elastic Cache kind of takes two popular open source technologies and then provides enhancements and a management layer on top of them. 
It comes in two flavors, so the two uh, most popular in-memory engines, Memcached and Redis. Memcached has been uh, was introduced in 2003 and has been a kind of golden standard for caching since. Really, the, the beauty of Memcached is in its speed and its simplicity. So it's in memory, it's very fast, it's very simple, it's essentially put in strings in memory, um, very low number of APIs, mostly gets and puts. What it doesn't provide is it doesn't provide any availability or persistence options. So the use cases for using Memcached would be for data which is either easily recoverable or something like a session store if you're okay with um, you know, potentially having disruption to that, uh, um, to that session. If you're looking for something which is more durable and more persistent, but still has the in-memory latency, the in-memory performance of Memcached, this is where we offer Redis. So Redis is more of an in-memory um, key value data store. So it's not, it's not just for caching. And the reason for that is it provides one, it provides high availability and persistent options. So you can have read replicas that um, kind of a primary replica configuration that we talk about more in the next slide, where if something happens to one of your nodes, you still have the data saved in another. Um, it also provides more sophisticated data types, such as lists, sets, and sorted sets, and a few others. And I encourage you to attend the Elastic Edge deep dive session that we have tomorrow morning we go deeper into you know, each of those, uh, what it means, and what are some of the cool use cases, the cool stuff that you can do using them. So I talked a little bit about um, replication in Redis. Um, let's go a little deeper into that. So in Redis, Redis allows you to have a primary node, a master, and zero or more replicas that will asynchronously replicate the data from that primary. So your primary will be able to um, accept writes, uh, basically both read and write requests, and your replicas are read-only replicas. So they'll get the data from the primary and your application can read from them. So this is a, a cool option that Redis provides, but if this is something that you are managing on your own, right, there's a lot of overhead involved. So for that configuration, you need to provision the instances, right? You need to install Redis on each. You need to attach the replicas to the primary. Now you need a monitoring system that, you know, if something happens to any one of those nodes, you detect this, then you provision new replicas and connect them and sync the data. So there's really a lot of overhead involved. And the cool thing about Elasticache is we do all of this for you. So we, um, with a few clicks on the console, you can provision this entire um, this entire architecture that we call replication group that has a primary and one or more replicas. They're all connected, they all have the data synced, and we also monitor that in real time so that if you know, any of your nodes fail, so for example, if one of your replicas fail, we detect that, we automatically bring up a new replica, sync it with the primary, and kind of have all the data on it, um, and that new replica will have the same endpoint as the old one. And that's actually important because that means that your application doesn't need to change. What you don't want to happen is every time you know, there is something happened to your database layer, now you have a, a different node with a different endpoint, so now your application needs to account for that. And kind of on your client, you need to change that endpoint. Um, so you don't need to do any of that here using Elastic Cache. If your primary fails and you have um, the feature here is multi-AZ enabled, then we also automatically monitor the primary. If that fails, we select the most up-to-date replica and promote it to become the new primary so that your failover is faster than just waiting for a replacement of a node. Um, and we propagate the endpoint that was pointing to the old primary now to point to the new primary. And the reason we do that is, again, so that your application that is using that endpoint can continue using that same endpoint that will now just point in a different node. So again, we do this so that your application doesn't need to change and kind of there's nothing you need to do and all of this happens automatically. So we'll get back to this slide at the end of the session. There is, this has been a high level overview. There's a lot more to learn, both about Elastic Cache and about DynamoDB. 
Um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to CodeDeep to talk about their cool real-time analytics system they built using DynamoDB and Elasticsearch. Uh, thanks, Dan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kuldeep Chauhan, and I'm from uh, Expedia. I'm here to talk about how Expedia uses, a di uses DynamoDB and Elastic Cache for a real-time application. So what can you expect part of the session? I'll go through an overview of what Expedia does in AWS. I'll talk about a, the application, the real-time analytic application, what was the initial design decisions that we made, uh, what were the challenges that we faced after we were running for some time, and then how did we redesign the application, and also some of the recommendations that we have for folks who are running DynamoDB and Elastic Cache. So uh, I'm, I'm an engineering manager at Expedia. I lead a team of engineers who provide a self-service platform on top of AWS services. Uh, we, we, have, we, run, we have multiple VPCs in Amazon. Uh, we have built self-service automation where teams can go and deploy to multiple regions at any time that they want. It's fully automated. We have actually automated uh, the creation of VPCs as well. We follow DevOps principles. Uh, we treat infrastructure as software. Um, and I'm also leading an effort right now to run our microservices uh, using Amazon's EC2 container service. Prior to working at Expedia, I worked at uh, Shell and Microsoft. I don't think Expedia needs an introduction. Expedia is uh, one of the uh, world's leading travel agencies out there. Our mission is to change travel with the power of uh, technology. Uh, we are passionate about travel, right, and we want to simplify um, and improve the customer experience with the power of uh, technology. We have more than 100 points of sale across 60 countries, and we have offices across the globe as well. So uh, these are some of the services that we use in Amazon. There are others as well. Um, we have around 200 uh, microservices that we are running in different Amazon regions. We are in seven Amazon regions right now, and uh, we, have, we use Direct Connect to connect to our data centers. We have uh, VPCs, which are, which are uh, PCI compliant as well, and uh, our biggest uh, usage of Amazon is EC2. We run uh, big data processing as well in Amazon. Uh, we run EMR, we have Spark jobs that are running, both ad hoc and uh, streaming jobs as well. So this is a visual representation of our services that we have, uh, that we use in Amazon. As you can see, EC2 is the biggest one. Then we do use a lot of cloud formation stacks, uh, auto-scaling groups, which again, are scale up and down based on the CPU and memory utilization. And uh, we use RDS for our relational needs. We have DynamoDB, Elastic Cache clusters, and a lot of S3 storage. So this is all like all our footprint that we have in Amazon. I'm just going to talk about one service that uses both DynamoDB and Elastic Cache. So what is the application that I want to talk about? So the application collects the A-B tests that happen on our sites and processes the data and stores them in a data store. Right? For those of you who don't know what A-B testing is, A-B testing gives you a way where you can test the same application but two different, two different versions of the same application with the same customers that you have and you can gauge which version of the application your customers uh, would like. Typically, A-B testing is done when you are launching a new feature and you want to know whether the feature that you are trying to build, is that something your customers would like, rather than you spending like six months and then finding out whether my application is actually worth, uh, used, used by my customers. So that is A-B testing. But this is basically collects the uh, A-B tests that run on all of our Expedia sites. It processes about 200 uh, million messages per day. Uh, we use Apache Storm, we use uh, Elastic Cache and uh, Elastic Cache Redis and DynamoDB to store the process data. Uh, the application has been designed um, 
designed to handle burst traffic that happened throughout the day on our Expedia sites. So this is a very high-level architecture diagram of our, uh, the, the application that I'm going to talk. Um, we have a continuous stream of data which tells the different interactions that are happening on our sites. So we use Apache Storm to hook into that stream of data. We process that data, and we store it in both DynamoDB and uh, Elastic Cache. You can see that I'm using two stores here. Uh, by the end of this presentation, you will understand why I have two stores, both DynamoDB and Elastic Cache Redis. So again, before I go, go deep into it, I'll begin with why did we choose DynamoDB? So our data store is a simple key value based store, right? And when we started working on this application two years ago, um, there was already success in Expedia of people running Cassandra cluster in AWS. In AWS or in our data centers, All right? So we started spinning, uh, setting time to spin up three node Cassandra cluster, um, and we spent about a week, but we were nowhere close to uh, getting it up and running. Uh, it's not that we couldn't get Cassandra actually working; it's that the way that we wanted, we couldn't get it running. And as with any other project, the deadlines are, were tight, so we started looking at DynamoDB, and we were up and running in a day. So the, the main three reasons why we chose DynamoDB was the setup, right? Like it's a managed setup. I don't have to manage the infrastructure. Let Amazon manage the infrastructure for me, right? And then the monitoring, which you get through CloudWatch, and ease to scale. As earlier Dan mentioned, you just change the write throughput and the read throughput, and then you have your uh, uh, DynamoDB table scaling up and down. And the other benefit is you don't need a dedicated team to manage the infrastructure. You, you can actually focus that resources somewhere else to actually work on your application. So with this, our initial design was just one DynamoDB table with the primary key be the experiment date, uh, and then secondary key just to store the results that happened. And there were no other secondary keys that we had. Some of the assumptions that we started was we expect about 1.5 GB of data per day, and we wanted to store data for at least, I think, six months when we started earlier. And then we also wanted to make sure that it doesn't affect our application performance. Um, so the initial design was pretty simple, row creation. We look up by the primary key. If that data doesn't exist, then we create it in the DynamoDB uh, table. And for updates, we retrieve all the uh, rows based on the primary key check if there is an update, and then uh, update the data back to the uh, table. So with this, right, we were up and running. Our application was performing well. We were happy. But as time progressed, we, we saw that the requests were getting throttled. Right? All the write requests that were, we were trying to do on DynamoDB were getting throttled. So to, to mitigate that problem, we started changing the uh, write throughput which resulted in significant cost, right? Like as you change uh, the right throughput, you have to pay more to uh, Amazon. So we started paying, we, had, we increased our right throughput to 35,000, whereas it was, uh, the sustained um, right throughput was only 3,500. So even after we changed this, we were seeing a lot of uh, requests getting throttled on our, uh, in, on, on our table. So the throttling happened as the table size grew, right? We, the table alone, this one table is around 4.6 terabytes worth of data in just one table. So then we started looking at it, and then we started investigating why is this happening, right? We, we don't want to change the right throughput forever and then pay more, right? So then we started looking at it. Then we looked at our access patterns of how the data is being uh, used. So we, and what we found out was most of our read and write requests was towards the most recent data. Even though we were storing it for like a year, we were not really, the requests that were coming was only towards the recent data. And then there were a lot of repeat requests that were happening, which was wasting our throughput. And the most important thing, please read the documentation carefully. So we went back, we read the documentation. Um, so if you see, uh, DynamoDB creates a partition for every 10 GB, right? So we were 4.6 terabytes of 
uh, table size, so we had 460 uh, partitions. And on top of it, the biggest problem is, uh, if you read again clearly this one, uh, what Amazon does is it distributes the uh, throughput that you assign to your table equally among the partitions. So literally, each partition only got 75 as their throughput, even though we had 35,000, right? And as I said earlier, most of our request was towards recent data, not for all the data. So that's why our uh, requests that were coming into the system were getting throttled. So then we started looking at how can we optimize this, right? So then we started, we thought about adding a caching layer. So that's where uh, Redis comes into picture. And I'll talk about why we chose Elastic Cache in the next slide. But we are using Elastic Cache uh, Redis. And the, the decision was, we read uh, from Redis for the conditional reads, and everything else comes from DynamoDB table. If, if, there, are no, if there is no data in, the, in Redis, it comes from uh, DynamoDB. And we, we were expecting to get, cut our uh, throughput to like by 10 times, like to 3,500. So that was what we was expecting. And then, then uh, again, before I go into what, what were the improvements that we saw, why we chose again, uh, Elastic Cache, Elastic Cache supports both Memcache uh, and Redis. And biggest benefit, again, as I mentioned earlier, for Dynamo as well, it's managed. So we don't have to keep running the uh, EC2 instances and then put Redis on top of it. Uh, and then you get CloudWatch monitoring. We get uh, read replicas. As earlier Dan mentioned, we have, you can have multiple read replicas. And then we haven't had a situation where we had to fo uh, automatically fall back to the a replica, but we know that at least if something goes back, the uh, read replicas will get promoted. You get multi automated backups, multi-AZ uh, disaster recovery scenario as well. So that's why we chose uh, Elastic Cache. So after we had this in place, right, after all what we observed was the repeat requests were, no, were not even making to DynamoDB. Right? Everything was being served from Redis. You can clearly see that right after we added it, the, right, uh, the throttle request dropped down to zero. And we were doing about 750,000, I think 750,000 uh, throttle write requests. As soon as we added Redis, it just dropped down. And the, the hit ratio on the, uh, on the Redis was like three to one. So 3,000 hits versus 1,000 misses. The 1,000 misses was served from DynamoDB at that point. And then we, as, as I mentioned, we were able to cut down our uh, write capacity to 3,500 now from 35,000. If you really look, it's not visible here, but our uh, actually sustained uh, write, read throughput, write throughput right now is only 300. Earlier it was like 3,500. Now that also came down to 300, but to make sure our application performs well during uh, peak loads, we are at 3,500, right? And with this, we have a very high-performing application with both DynamoDB and Elastic Cache. So these are some of the recommendations that we have at, at based on our experience, right? Um, take a close look at your access patterns, and then see your access patterns will tell you a lot of things how you can design your application. Then next up, if you need any, if you think there are a lot of repeat requests that are coming into the system, try adding a caching layer. We are using Redis. You can use Memcache as well. And then, as I said uh, earlier, we were changing the right throughput so that our applications perform well. Even though it's cost, like you pay more, but at least that keeps your application running. So look, have a very close look at the right throughput and the read throughput that you have configured. Yep. With that, I think our experience of using DynamoDB and Elastic Cache with, with, for this application will also help you. With this, I will hand it over to Ayan from uh, Mapbox. Thanks, Kuldeep. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ian Ward. I work at Mapbox. Uh, I'm an engineer on the uh, platform team, where I do a mix of uh, system operations, uh, monitoring, and application development. And I'm going to talk about how we use DynamoDB uh, in conjunction with Elastic Cache uh, and a few other services to improve, improve our overall um, performance around the world. 
So I'm going to explain a little bit about what Mapbox is to paint the picture about the business requirements that we have uh, for our customers, and then uh, explain more about how we use AWS, and then talk about why we use DynamoDB, and then how we use ElastiCache um, to get uh, additional performance. So first of all, there are 11 of us here at this reInvent. Uh, we have a booth. Uh, we love talking about how we use AWS and hearing about how other people use AWS. We also have uh, sales and support members from our team. So stop on by the booth. Uh, we're, we're happy to talk. So what is Mapbox? Mapbox is a mapping platform for uh, developers. It's, uh, we provide tools, um, so de uh, design and data, software, uh, to help you build maps um, to get the exact look you're going for with the data that you want on that map. And then we have developer tools. So once you build a map and push it up to our global platform, which is hosted in nine regions around the world, uh, you can pull down uh, the map into your application. And we have APIs uh, for search and geocoding uh, and other APIs like uh, directions. So design and data, uh, we have a program called Mapbox Studio. Uh, you can go and add data into this application and edit it in a visual way, completely visual way now, in the newest version. Um, and customize the map exactly as you like using the exact fields that are available in the data that you add to it. We also have a global streets uh, base layer that we provide uh, that you're able to use as well. And then developer tools. Uh, we have a mobile SDK, so you can pull the map down from our platform into your application uh, or your web app, so we have a JavaScript SDK as well. These are all open source. Uh, the code is available on GitHub. You can look at them modify them, and so on. We have APIs for doing things like geocoding. So you give a place name, and you can get back a latitude and longitude, or do the opposite, give a lat lon, and you'll get back uh, a place name. And then we have uh, APIs for walking, biking, and driving directions. Uh, these are a few of the APIs we have. We have other APIs. You can read about them on our uh, website. Uh, but the point here is that we have um, building blocks. You can combine. Use just one or two of them or combine them all to get the exact uh, needs for uh, your use case. So uh, what I'm going to do is um, talk about um, who uses Mapbox, explain the, the business need here, um, and then explain how we uh, meet that. So this is a map uh, that uh, Foursquare built using Mapbox uh, of their <coughs> user base around the world. Um, so Foursquare, if you go to foursquare.com, a big component of their uh, web page is the map. Uh, you can search for places to grab dinner, get a coffee, a coffee with your friends or a beer uh, to meet up. Um, and uh, the point here is that their users are all over the world. Uh, we have customers uh, like Foursquare, enterprise customers, high volume customers. Um, and we also have customers that are just uh, smaller, uh, but they're maybe based in New Zealand uh, or South America. The thing is that they want, um, all these customers want very fast maps, and they want highly available maps uh, wherever they are. So I'm going to get into next how we uh, meet that need. And so uh, the usage of uh, AWS services by Mapbox can be roughly broken down into uh, two types. Uh, we have processing stacks. So to be able to serve maps, we're processing, um, like our, our global streets data is based on, a lot of it's based on OpenStreetMap which is like uh, Wikipedia uh, for maps. Anyone can create an account and edit geographic data about uh, streets anywhere in the world, um, add data, improve data, uh, and so on. We're also processing, uh, just last month, uh, we processed a few petabytes of satellite imagery. Uh, so we have a satellite base later that you're able to use on your maps as well. And we're constantly processing uh, changes as they're coming in from uh, both satellite and uh, sources like OpenStreetMap. And then um, before, so we have to do this processing before we can serve out any uh, API requests. Um, but then we have uh, um, stacks that are running our API as well. So here's a diagram of uh, example architecture. Uh, in the green there, you can see OpenStreetMap changes coming in. Uh, we process those on uh, ec 2 on the spot market uh, using some applications that we're running. Uh, same thing with routing data. A lot of routing data is based on OpenStreetMap data as well. And so as changes come in, um, one of our goals is to have a map that is accurate to uh, the current time. So 
as soon as something changes around the world, new street, uh, streets are added, construction happens, uh, the order of a the direction of a street changes, it's changed, and so we update that immediately uh, so that it's available on everyone's maps. Um, so then the, the blue area here, uh, the platform, is what I'm going to talk about uh, next. And this is a zoom in of that um, platform. Uh, so this is an example, this is a Maps API service. Uh, requests originate, they come in through clients, mobile, web, uh, they hit DNS, we're using Route 53, and they'll hit one of uh, CloudFront's uh, edge uh, caching locations around the world. And from there, we're using latency-based routing, and it will go to one of nine regions around, around the world, we're running in all nine AWS regions around the world, and it will hit an ELB using latency-based routing. From there, the request will go back and hit application servers. And then, in order to um, serve a map, we need to look up um, that, uh, who that map belongs to, so the user. And then we need to look up uh, the details about that map, so like the default zoom level, um, where the map is centered by default, and so on. And so all these lookups go to DynamoDB. And then, uh, once we get those, uh, that information, we need to look up uh, details uh, and get um, objects that have been processed um, and put it through the processing uh, part of our stacks. Uh, outputs uh, are, are put up to S3, so um, vector tile data, raster tiles that present uh, map, map data. They're stored in S3, so we need to fetch those, and then our application will do things like composite uh, these objects together uh, color them uh, based on the needs of the particular map, and then they're served back out. So, as I said, we're in nine regions around the world, and we have uh, CloudFront uh, in over 52 edge locations in front of that. So, you get a lot of performance gain just by adding a CDN, but what I'm going to talk about is then what we do with DynamoDB and ElastiCache to then uh, save a lot of time in the back end as well. So in DynamoDB, we store, uh, we use it as our metadata database. Uh, when you create an account on mapbox.com, uh, an object is created in DynamoDB, which represents uh, your, your user. And then when you create maps, we're creating documents uh, in DynamoDB that represent those maps, uh, records uh, within the database. And then we have uh, things like data sets where you can draw on the map, uh, draw areas on the map, uh, shapes, um, points and so on, and then access tokens. Those are all also documents in DynamoDB. And so we didn't always use DynamoDB. We started off with SimpleDB um, about five years ago, and this is another uh, product uh, by Amazon. We switched off of that because of some of the limitations at the time around uh, the types that we could store in there and lengths. And we switched to CouchDB, and we started running our own CouchDB service, uh, a few servers to start with on EC2. But then we, as we were growing over the years, um, we ended up running uh, in three regions, uh, CouchDB clusters. So these clusters consisted of three to six nodes in three regions uh, around the world. And we were replicating between uh, the three regions for global redundancy. And then just this summer, we completed a, a total migration to DynamoDB. So we're no, lo no longer running CouchDB. And uh, I'll get into why we did this uh, momentarily. So first of all, though, why NoSQL? Uh, we don't have a ton of relations in our database uh, between fields, for example, between columns. Um, so yes, users own maps, and uh, tokens belong to users. Uh, but we're not doing a lot of like ad hoc querying and so on. We do do a lot of this, but they're in separate, um, separate stacks that we're doing analytics on. So we use Redshift. For example, we put all of our, all of our CloudFront logs into Redshift, and we're able to do operational um, queries to see what's going on on the edge uh, at any given time, uh, and also uh, business intelligence uh, queries. But this is all on a, a separate, separate databases. So we're able to separate those concerns. And we have uh, NoSQL on our API, uh, which is known um, for scalability and for just overall performance. And so with CouchDB, uh, we are running it. Uh, ourselves. Um, does everybody remember Heartbleed? Um, so when Heartbleed occurred, uh, I remember sitting there thinking, how are we going to go and uh, upgrade SSL, open SSL on all of our um, database nodes, uh, upgrade the operating systems, uh, upgrade 
Nginx, uh, which we're using as a proxy in front of Couch, and also thinking about, okay, so how is CouchDB affected? We do a lot of uh, programming in Node.js, C++, and other languages, but we don't do a lot of Erlang programming, which is what CouchDB is written in. And um, so at the time, we were just basically trying to figure out what was affected and so on. Instead of um, focusing time on our application, we were dealing with um, what to do with this infrastructure so that uh, security was maintained. And it was a lot of work. It is a lot of work. And then um, we were also thinking at the time, like as we're scaling up, we're looking at how do we go about partitioning our data across the CouchDB nodes. Um, once data wouldn't fit on single nodes, for example, and we estimated that it would take uh, a month or two of work to be able to make that transition to start partitioning data differently, um, and just decided that um, time is better spent on our application. Time is better spent on making our product better and not on worrying about those details at this time. And so DymoDB, it's fast. It's available in nine regions, the regions where we're running, uh, and it integrates with other services like CloudTrail, uh, like IAM. And so looking uh, back at this diagram here, um, as I said, we're running our application in nine regions, and Elasticache is running in nine regions, but S3 and DynamoDB are running in two regions, two to three regions. And so I want to talk about why, why that is and how we get away with that. So there are trade-offs. Um, we want high availability. We want very high performance all around the world. But also, can you imagine if you have, well, we have billions and billions of objects stored in S3, hundreds of terabytes uh, stored in S3 of geographic data. And so if we were to store those in all nine regions, uh, total copies, uh, it would just be, we wouldn't be competitive cost-wise. Uh, and also the complexity, for example, if we were replicating, you know, it's complex enough, we're using DynamoD, DynamoDB streams and Lambda to replicate between uh, DynamoDB in three regions. But uh, if we were replicating between nine regions, you know, it's the same, would be the similar strategy, but when something goes wrong, it's that much more complexity to deal with uh, if replication breaks down or if there's uh, something that's inconsistent that we need to deal with. Uh, so it's a trade-off about, uh, about that. But we also, how do we, how do we get the high performance? if we're not running those, those services in the same regions. And so this is where Elasticache comes into play for us. Uh, we're, we're able to use Elasticache to effectively emulate DynamoDB and S3 in the regions where those two services are not running. Um, and so uh, when a request comes through our application for DynamoDB object or an S3 object, it goes to Elasticache first and checks if it's there. If it's not there, and this is um, you know, uh, much lower latency than going across, for example, from uh, Sydney all the way to the United States or to Europe where DynamoDB or S3 are running. Um, if it's in last cache, we, we immediately are able to return the request to the user. If it's not, then we have to go back. But, but adding that caching layer makes a huge difference. So with last cache, we're able to be faster, uh, do things much cheaper, and it simplifies uh, everything a great deal, but not, not having to deal with uh, replicating everywhere. And so this is a glance of what latency looked like before we turned on Elasticache. You can see there in uh, uh, South America, for example, is very red. Red represents um, slower, more latent. Um, in Australia, New Zealand, um, much of Asia, even in the Rockies there in the United States is uh, somewhat reddish. And if you look, once we turn on Elasticache, you can see that how it kind of Makes a, uh, it made a huge difference, actually, for us. There's another view of it uh, in a graph. Uh, this is uh, in a region in the United States where Elasticache and S3 are not running. Uh, sorry, where DynamoDB and S3 are not running. And this is a cold cache. Uh, this represents latency from the Elastic Load Balancer back to the application. And then very quickly, once the, cache, the Elasticache cache warms up, we drop uh, below, um, well below 150 milliseconds. And over the course of an hour or two, we get down to latency that's pretty much the same as the latency uh, as where we are running DynamoDB and, and, and S3 in, in the regions where, the, where we run those. And so just to conclude, uh, the main points um, to sum this up is, uh, so we have 170 million users worldwide um, that are viewing our maps uh, or our customers' maps that they built with Mapbox. And uh, this is how we did combine DynamoDB and S3 with Elasticache. Um, to serve requests uh, through nine regions. And by doing this, we're able to cut end user latency in half and do, the, do it 85% cheaper than the alternative solutions, uh, which would be 
putting the information everywhere in all the nine regions. And so even with a CDN, uh, there's a lot of time to save in the back end by uh, making choices uh, like I've described here. And we've learned to lean on AWS for managed services. We thought, you know, when we we're going to turn on, we thought about turning on ElastiCache. We're using the Redis in LRU mode. We thought, okay, we're going to build a, a caching service ourselves, right? But ready, let's, let's do it. But then we thought, you know, what we're about to do is what we did with CouchDB. We'd be in that same spot uh, again where we'd have to deal with OS upgrades, deal with software upgrades, uh, and all the difficulties around that. And so we didn't want to spend our time there. Uh, we wanted to spend it on making Mapbox itself better. And so uh, this is just overall a, kind of a, a picture of how to use uh, different AWS services strategically together to reduce complexity and cost uh, and meet, meet your business needs. And with that, uh, thank you, and uh, pass it back to Dan. Thanks, Dan. All right. First, thanks a lot, Ian and Kodeep, for sharing two very interesting use cases. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of different things you can do with this building blocks of um, DynamoDB and ElastiCache. Uh, this has been, and we just showed you two, this has been a 200-level session. There is a lot more to learn about these services and about some of the use cases and design patterns that you can do. So for DynamoDB, we have a deep dive session, but unfortunately that one happened earlier today. However, um, there will be a recording of that session that I highly recommend. As a, there's a lot more into how to build and structure and query the data on DynamoDB and some of the, some of the considerations that Kudip and Ian talked about, but there's a lot more. Um, there is a workshop today about event-driven proce processing, programming, so that is the one that I mentioned for um, DynamoDB streams and Lambda. Um, it's a new concept, actually, we're trying this year. It's a workshop, so it's not a session. You will be trying things, um, trying things out on your own. Uh, and we have the DynamoDB for big data. That's tomorrow. That's how do you use DynamoDB for some of your big data use cases and also some cool examples from other customers as well. For ElastiCache, we have our deep dive session tomorrow morning when we will go much deeper into both Memcached and Redis, how to configure each, what are some of the, again, more use cases and design patterns, um, how to configure it correctly, what are some of the mistakes to avoid. Um, we also have a very detailed white paper. So this deck, when it's available, you have that link, but you can also Google ElastiCache white paper and you will, uh, you'll find that. With that, thank you very much for coming. Appreciate it. Um, please remember to complete your evaluations. We would love to hear your feedback. Cool DPN and me will stay here to stick around, so please come talk to us if you have any more questions. Thank you very much.